Good afternoon, folks. We are live today. We're going to be talking about Exodus chapter 29. Uh, we're going to be talking about the instructions for, not the actual, but the instructions for the uh, consecration of the priests and also for the um, uh, institution, the instructions for the institution of the daily sacrifice. Uh, it's just going to be one chapter today. It's a fairly long one. Um, some details, some references to the New Testament. Uh, looking forward in the type any type uh, theme that we've been covering pretty much since the beginning. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, uh, if you are here, drop a message. Let me know that you are watching. I've got my phone up as well. Let's see uh, who pops on here. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started and uh, get through this today. Um, we've got quite a bit going on today uh, with other things, with my novels and with my gaming system and just everything that's going on. So I um, need to, uh, to get done with this and see to the kids, see to dinner, and then uh, get prepared for that tonight. So uh, thank you for joining. We're in Exodus 29. We're going to be reading out of the King James. We have the ESV open for some modern English considerations. Uh, I will be referring to the ESV a couple of times, um, and then I have access to uh, the original language as needed. So, hello Caleb, welcome aboard. Uh, Alright, so Exodus chapter 29 and verse 1, and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, talking about Aaron and his sons, to hallow them or to consecrate them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. All right, so remember, Moses is up on the mountain. He's going to be up there for 40 days and 40 nights receiving all of these instructions, um, not just the Ten Commandments, but a whole host of things he's getting uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. And so we're still in that context. We're still up on the mountain with Moses, um, and he is receiving these instructions. He hasn't actually come down and started to implement these things yet. And so God is telling him, this is what you're going to do to consecrate the priests for service to me in the tabernacle and later the temple. It says, take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. Um, the idea of uh, being without blemish or without spot or without anything. Hey Chandler, welcome aboard. Um, without spot or blemish was of course typifying Christ, uh, that he was without sin, that, he was, uh, that his sacrifice on the cross was without sin uh, to atone for our sins. And so these animals needed to be without spot or blemish, anything uh, that was uh, no sickness, nothing, nothing. Uh, they had to be perfect in every way. Um, and of course, God providentially was going to be providing that for them. There would never be a time where they would need to offer such a thing and they could not find such a thing in their flocks. God was taking care of them for that. So, All right. <clears throat> so we have one young bullock and two rams. And then verse 2 says, And an unleavened bread, and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheat and flour, shall you make them. And you shall put them into one basket, and bring them into the basket with a bullock and the two rams. So a couple of points here. Number one, with these uh, animals, with this flesh that was going to be sacrificed, there was also bread. Uh, number one, this uh, points out that there were things other than uh, animal sacrifices. There was a, quite a bit of things that were sacrificed to God. It was not just animals. There was uh, animals, certainly. Uh, blood was definitely necessary. But you also have uh, here the unleavened bread representing what they had uh, coming out of Egypt uh, with the Passover and whatever. Um, and then you had uh, sheave offerings with, with grains and with wine and any number of things could be offered uh, be, depending on what they were offered for. And so all of these things were brought and there was going to be actually uh, three separate offerings are going to be made here. So uh, the second thing to deal with, uh, to, to understand with this, is that in bringing the flesh and the bread, there's actually a typifying here of Christ. Christ sacrificed himself. His, he, he talks about, this is my flesh. Um, he gave his, his physical body under went all kinds of torture and then was physically sacrificed on the cross uh, when, when the Jews called for his crucifixion, the Romans crucified him. Um, but God doesn't want us to be cannibals. That's, that's not the point of this. It, the, the, the point of 
uh, the sacrifice or, or the, the communion was to remember the cost. And so here the bread being offered with the flesh is a looking forward to what we partake of every first day of the week, which is uh, the, the unleavened bread in remembrance of Christ and the cost that he paid for us. Um, and so uh, there's, there's this, this typifying, and that needs to be understood right here from the beginning when we start talking about this consecration of the priesthood is, is the cost and the, the symbolism of uniting flesh and bread here. We don't, we don't actually partake of any kind of animal flesh. We don't, we don't eat meat when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, there isn't actually any physical meat involved at all. And part of that is um, we, the reason we use the symbolic bread instead of cooking like burgers or something. Um, the reason that we have symbolic bread is because we need to understand that all of this uh, that, that we partake of here in, under the New Testament is of a higher order. It's of a, a spiritual order. The bread is a pointer to the spiritual reality of the sacrifice of Christ. And so if we, um, make the microphone a little bit closer here, maybe y'all can hear me better. Um, hey, Rachel. <coughs> so if we, if we try to, uh, a lot of people are like, well, it's just ritualist, uh, ritual cannibalism or whatever. Well, they're, they're not understanding the purpose and the point of why we partake of the bread. The, the partaking of the bread is a remembrance. It's a reminder. It's not intended for us to be saying that we're actually feasting on Christ, which is why I have problems with transubstantiation. Transubstantiation that the Catholics teach is actually the bread somehow physically becomes Christ. Well, they've missed the point. They've totally gone um, beyond what the Bible is trying to point out here, and so um, anyway, here in this context, well, this is this is why the bread is offered with uh, these animals. So, verse four: And Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall wash them with water. So here they come to the door. This is their their first time. <clears throat> they're coming to the tabernacle, but they're not allowed to enter until they are washed. Well, again typifying they have to they have to undergo what is essentially a a ceremonial washing to enter into the presence of god well what do we have to do in the new testament it's the same thing before we can enter into the temple of god which is the church we have to be washed clean well how do we do that the very first time that we enter into the presence of god or, or the when we enter into the temple of god what do we have to do? Well, we have to be immersed. We have to we have to go down into the water and contact the blood of Christ that was our sacrifice and come up purified. And if you don't do that, there's a lot of people out there that are saying, "Well, I can be saved by faith only or I can I can be uh, choose the church of my choice and I can be a part of this church um, without ever having be being uh, uh, immersed in water." or sprinkled and you know a lot of people think it's sprinkling but that's that's not the case either but they try to get into the temple without being washed and again a lot of this comes from a lack of understanding of the old testament the the huge portion of the old testament is to give us these types these these lessons or these examples that point us to the purpose and the and the the strength of meaning of the things that we do in the new testament and for almost every denomination out there that teaches that uh, that water immersion is not necessary for salvation here you have it and uh, again we've talked about the flood and we've talked about the crossing of the red sea now you have the ritual washing of the priests they had to go through this sanctification process washed right at the gate or the door of the tabernacle and later the temple before they could enter it and so we have to do the same thing and it's not for us it's not just a ceremony it was something that we had to do before we could actually enter the same thing with the priest if a priest didn't do this if the priest didn't actually go through this washing sanctification process and they tried to enter into the tabernacle they would die their their life was forfeit they would they would be killed god would just kill them instantly and so 
<clears throat> that the, it, it isn't that the water itself, we even know that the blood of the bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. And so this is a typifying of the spiritual reality under the New Testament. Because water, water H2O, the chemical, doesn't do anything. Um, but in obeying God, in doing things according to the pattern that he has shown us in the New Testament, the way that Moses had to do things according to the pattern in the mount, um, we, uh, we come into contact with the blood of, of Christ in the water. And Romans 6 is very clear about that. And so uh, it, it's not that the water itself has the capability of, of removing the sin, but the obedient faith is what grace operates through to cleanse us of our sins. And so we absolutely must do that. We must be immersed in water the same way that the priest must have gone through the sanctification process before they could have entered the tabernacle. And you can't disassociate that. If you try to get into uh, the church that Jesus built, without going through the sanctification process, you didn't make it. You might be in a church, but it's going to be a man-made church. If, if, if you have a church that's teaching you can be a part of them without ever having been immersed into Christ, then that's a man-made church. That isn't the church that Jesus saved. And so you have to make that choice. Do I do, I do it man's way or do I do it the way that God showed us uh, in the New Testament? So that's, that's, that's your choice. So, all right. Um, so anyway, verse 4, they shall wash them with water, and then verse 5, and you shall take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate um, and gird him with the, uh, the the sash, basically the curious girdle of the ephod or the, the sash. Then shall put the mitre upon his head, that was the kind of the turban thing, and put the holy crown upon the mitre, and that was that was the thing that had the little golden plate uh, that, that said that he was holy and could come before God when he was wearing that. And you shall take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So he had to be an anointed priest in the same way that, that Jesus was anointed uh, with oil. And you shall bring his sons and put coats upon them and you shall girt them with, with girdles, that's the sashes, and Aaron and his sons and, and put the bonnets or the caps is what the ESV says. Uh, and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute and you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. So they come to the, the, the uh, opening of, of the tabernacle. They're right there in front of the, the tabernacle. Of course, that's where the altar is and everything. And so during this uh, ceremony, all of the priestly garments were put on them by Moses. They were, they were dressed in all of these special clothes that had been made uh, in the last chapter. Of course, remember, we're just talking about instructions here. This isn't actually going on yet. This is just Moses receiving the instructions to do these things. And so um, they they get all of their priestly robes on. Hey, Tracy. And they uh, get dressed up in the same way. Uh, what does the Christian have to do? Well, there's things that, that are required of us before we become Christians. God tells us that we have to hear the gospel. Romans ten seventeen. faith comes by hearing the word of God. Um, we have to believe it. Um, <laughs> And we have to uh, repent of our sins, and we have to confess our faith in Christ. Uh, these are the, the taking off of sin and the putting on of the, the robes of, of righteousness. We're trying to clothe ourselves in Christ, and we're putting these things on because we are about to become priests. Now, I can put on all of those clothes. That doesn't make me a priest yet. I still got to go through the, the washing, the sanctification process, and come into contact with the blood of Christ. And hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of my sins, and confessing my faith in Christ gets me to the door. But it's the water, because it's it's the water that brings me into contact with Christ. What did Jesus say? I am the door. So if we want to enter into the temple, we have to pass through the door. And so we can, we can get to the door, and we can put on all of these priestly robes and stuff, and we can start living a righteous life and trying to do good and do right. But we still haven't done the thing that actually removes the sin from us. And that's why immersion in water is so important and it cannot be left out. If you, if you think that you're going to heaven and, and, and that your immersion, uh, e either you don't have to do it and you've never done it, or you did it for random reasons not specified in scripture, you just got wet. Um, because 
maybe that's what your church required for membership in that local congregation or because it's an outward sign of an inward grace or all of these things that man has made up you aren't actually doing it to be saved as first peter three twenty one tells us then you haven't entered into the door you went through a different door into a different building and you're not going to be saved so um this is what this is all typifying here and i when we go through exodus and leviticus and and numbers is more history but Deuteronomy, when we go through these and we see all of these things that seem to be boring when we're growing up, you know, you listen to these things read maybe in a Bible class or maybe you're trying to read through them yourself or whatever. If you don't read them trying to understand what they point to in the New Testament, then you kind of, your eyes glaze over and you're just kind of reading words and they don't come into you. But if you... Well, yeah, Chandler, you definitely have to have faith to be saved. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah, that is exactly right. But faith alone does not save you. James chapter 2 says that. James 2.24 says that you are not saved by faith alone. And um, so God requires more than faith. He requires obedient faith. And that obedient faith requires us to do something. Um, that doesn't mean that we can be saved by works of our own righteousness. Um, we can't go around doing good to people and, and think that, that if I do enough good things that that will cover up the bad things that I've done. Um, and we can't, we can't be saved by the old law, which is what really all of this is pointing out. The, the need for a savior, the need for a, a new law, a better law. Um, and we certainly can't do it through works of the devil, but we can do it through works of obedience that, that God requires of us. He says, you do this and I will save you. And so if we don't do those things, God's not going to save us. And the other the other way to look at that is to, to say that, yes, works are absolutely necessary for salvation. The ones that God specifies are absolutely necessary for salvation. You have to do the works. You have to put your faith into action. That's what James 2 is all about. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about, that, that all these people who were believers acted on it. And it was a, an obedient faith that saved them, not just a faith alone demons even have that james 2 19 um so you're absolutely right chandler faith faith is absolutely required to be saved but you got to have more than just faith faith is alone is dead is is what james teaches us so anyway um we we try to read these things with understanding of what they point to in the new testament and when you do that suddenly these things aren't boring at all suddenly these things come to life and they have real solid meaning and you're like wow and it really brings out the power of what we do under the new testament and it really gives depth to the meaning of the actions that we're supposed to take because if you don't understand what you're supposed to be doing under the new testament then you're doing it your way or you're doing it man's way and you're not doing it as god has has taught us the way that he kept telling moses see that you do it the way that i showed you in the mount and so we are come to Mount Zion, which is the church, and God has given us a way in, in the law of, of Christ. And we have to do it according to his pattern, not by some whim of our own. All right. <clears throat> Verse 10, And you shall ca cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. Then you shall kill the bullock before Jehovah by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And you shall take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood inside the bottom of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the inward and, and the caul that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung you shall burn with fire. Outside of the camp it is a sin offering. So here's here's the first of the three major sacrifices that are going to happen this this particular day. And this particular sacrifice, the bullock, um, represents the sacrifice for the priests themselves. So Aaron and his four sons are brought before the tabernacle, and they are consecrated. And the laying of their hands on the bull represented them putting their sins off onto this bull. And uh, it, was a, it was a young bull. And uh, so they had to have their sins... Uh, symbolically taken away 
first before they could serve uh, for the people. And so that's what this sacrifice is for, is the taking away. And notice that all of this is consumed. There isn't anything left. The good parts uh, of this, the blood and the, the, uh, the, the goodly parts or whatever are burned on the altar. And then the parts that aren't so great, the guts and the, uh, uh, the skin and the, uh, the bile and all of the nasty stuff that comes out, uh, all of that stuff was to be burned outside of the camp. And it represented the, the sin being separated uh, from them through the sacrifice. Okay. Hey, Harold, welcome aboard. We're in uh, Exodus uh, 29 and we're in uh, verse 15. And then you shall take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and you shall slay the ram, and take, the, take his blood and sprinkle it around about upon the altar. And you shall cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inward of him and his legs, and put them into his pieces and into his head. And shall burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Okay, so this is the, the, the first of the two rams. <clears throat> They've already offered the bullock, and, and the, the, the first sacrifice was to take away the sins of the priests. Now you have the second ram. Yes, absolutely, Harold, uh, thank you. Um, but the second ram here represents a, uh, a consecration, um, if you will. Um, if you look up at the... Uh, ESV in verse 18 it says it's a food offering unto the Lord so this this food offering here is um, representing the the feast or the uh, the meal that we partake of with Christ with uh, the Father when we partake of the Lord's Supper um, so we we come together and we we are in communion with God and so that's what this sacrifice represents, is that the, the priests were sanctified now, and then they would be partaking of uh, a meal uh, in a symbolic fashion with Jehovah, who is their God. <coughs> and um, they, would, uh, they would be ready then to uh, deal with the sin offerings of the people. All right. Um, and then verse 19, you shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their ha hands upon the head of the ram, and you will kill the ram, and take his blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of the right hand, and upon the great toe of the right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So this taking of the blood and putting it, they put it on the right ear, um, and then on the right thumb, and then on the right big toe, uh, shows the totality of... Uh, where the, the 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 blood was a complete covering, that it went from essentially from head to toe, um, but it also specifically covered their hand where the work is done, symbolizing the work that needed to be done on behalf of the people, and so uh, the the sacrifice here, each little step, it's not it's not just empty ceremony. Everything has a meaning that's being done, and so. Uh, from the head, this is the, the representing the hearing of God's word, the doing of God's word, and the taking of God's word. And so um, there was a, a complete submission to the Lord in these priests. They were doing all that God said. They would listen to what God had for them to say. Uh, they would do uh, them in themselves. They would do what God had commanded them to do. And then they would take that message to the people um, and uh, they would be wholly given to Jehovah in everything that they did. And that's what this is, is it's consecrating them for the work that they were supposed to do. Okay, um, and then verse 21, you shall take the blood that is on the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him and he shall be consecrated and his garments and his sons and his sons garments with him and so there was a consecrating or a sanctifying of the actual garments that they were wearing um, we see throughout the old testament and in the new testament come wash your robes and i will make them white as snow and so there's this this washing of these garments and this blood the sprinkling of that uh, blood upon them uh, to represent the consecration now note 
in the Old Testament. When this was done, there wasn't actually a whitening of these garments. And the reason for that is because the blood of wolves and goats cannot take away sin. This was typifying what would eventually happen on the spiritual level in the New Testament. All right, verse 22. <clears throat> you shall also take the ram and the fat and the rump and the fat that covers the inward and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and the right shoulder for it is a ram of consecration and one loaf of bread and one cake of oil bread and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before Jehovah. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and shall wave them for a wave offering before Jehovah. And ye shall receive them of their hands and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering for a sweet savor before Jehovah. It is an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. And ye shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before Jehovah and it shall be your part. So here's the here's the the last part of this this consecration ceremony here is this this last ram was divided between God and the priests. And the dividing of this, the, the, the meal that they were going to eat, shows this communion that we partake in. That when we partake, Jesus said that I'm going to be there uh, partaking with you. That uh, I will not eat it again until I am in the kingdom. Well, the kingdom is the church. And so uh, every time the church partakes of the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine or the wine or whatever you want to call it, um, Jesus is there with us. He is eating with us. And so here you have part of the ram is given to Jehovah God and part of it is given to the priest and they were to consume it as a meal um, to remind them that they were in fact communing with the Lord, that they had been sanctified um, and they were in a right relationship. Now remember... <clears throat> this relationship that they had with God was not um, a total correction of their relationship. This was a looking forward to Messiah. This was a looking forward to an actual uh, reconciliation between God and mankind. So this was symbolic, this was typifying, this was looking forward, but this wasn't actually the, the rectifying of the problem where sin separates us from God. Um, they were still going to be separated, but as long as they remained faithful and did the things that God said, when his son came, they would, in truth, receive the forgiveness of their sins, um, and then they would be uh, free on Judgment Day to uh, go to heaven and come out of Hades, the paradise side of Hades, and uh, join God, just like all of the faithful that come after the cross. So... All right, uh, you shall sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering which is waved and which is heaved upon, of the ram of the consecration, even that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel for his heave offering. And it shall be heave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, even their heave offering unto Jehovah. Hey, Judy, welcome aboard. So... <clears throat> All of this um, is relating to the consecration of the priest and to get them ready to serve as priest before Jehovah um, on behalf of the people. And so everything in here has been has been uh, symbolic of that. They, they first had to be cleansed, then they offered unto God to, to show um, this is this is what they owe to God, kind of like what we give on the first day of the week. Uh, when we give of our means or whatever, we give a portion back to God uh, for his use, for his work. Um, and then you have also this, the third uh, step there was for them to partake of uh, a typifying of the Lord's Supper, where we partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, and so they, they took a little bit of flesh, they took a little bit of the unleavened bread, and that showed that they were sitting down. Um, you know, we sing a song, all things are ready, come to the feast. Well, the feast is going on now. The idea that the, the bride and, the, and the, the lamb are married now and they are producing offspring now. Um, that the, the wedding feast of uh, the, after the wedding, you know, we talk about the wedding reception or whatever, that everybody is invited to come to that um, if they will do the things that, they are, that, that is necessary to be done. And so that's what we partake of now. All right, uh, verse 29. 
Uh, and the holy gar garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. And what that means is that after Aaron passed away, then one of his sons would become high priest. And he would have to go through the sanctification process to become high priest. And that their sons also would have to go through this, this whole, this whole consecration ceremony that we're talking about here. Um, they would have to go through it before they could serve in that priestly capacity. And it's Aaron and his sons and his offspring perpetually. And, and again, we talked about this last time yesterday. The idea of forever is for as long as the law of Moses was in effect. Because their forever ended when, uh, you know, in, in terms of its spiritual authority, it ended at the cross. And in terms of its, its civil authority, it ended when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple wiped out the the official records of who was descended from who nobody can officially say according to the law of moses who is descended from aaron now and so they don't have a priesthood anymore they cannot follow the law of moses that's why they're stuck following the talmud the the rabbinical traditions rather than the law of moses they really only give the law of moses lip service these days um, and even those who are um uh, you know they they try to hold on to the old testament say we have to do things in the old testament we have to follow the ten commandments or whatever they don't even follow most of what the Old Testament says. They just pick and choose what they think they should follow, and they just do that. But anybody who's doing that, Galatians 5.4 says that if you try to justify yourself according to the law of Moses, you have fallen from grace. And without grace, you can't be saved. And so uh, doing all of these things is, is, is not necessary anymore because Christ has already come. Messiah is already here. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, 31, and you shall take the ram of the consecration and seed his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. So if you are outside of the, the people, specifically outside of the priesthood, um, you couldn't eat of those things because they have been sanctified. And so the same way in, in the New Testament, if you are outside of the church, the one church that Jesus built, if you are outside of the temple of Christ, you cannot partake in any of the blessings that come for being a part of that. You're, you're not sanctified. And, and the things that God gives specifically to Christians, this, the spiritual blessings that we get, are only for Christians. And so uh, it's, it's just another way of saying you can't be saved outside of, of that one church. So, um, <clears throat> All right, verse 34. And if all of the flesh of the consecrations or of the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire, and it shall not be eaten because it is holy. And this kind of reminds me actually a little bit of uh, uh, what I learned of, of the Native Americans growing up. When they, when they would kill a buffalo, nothing went to waste everything was used everything was consumed um there was a, a completeness or a wholeness to the process of hunting a buffalo and then using every part of it for something whether it was for food or for tools or or to make um, clothing or to make uh, their their tents or whatever all of it was used and so here we see as well everything has to be uh, either eaten or offered or consumed and, and be done with it. There wasn't anything left over. There was there was nothing that was supposed to remain and to, to putrefy and get gross. And um, a part of that was probably uh, hygienic in nature. All right. Uh, so verse 36. All right, let's see here. Nope, 35. And you shall do, uh, or this you shall do unto Aaron and to his sons according to all things which I have commanded you. So there again. Do everything that I tell you to do. Don't deviate from that. God doesn't want us to do anything else. He doesn't want us to do anything less. He doesn't want us to do anything more. Just do what I tell you to do. And it's because God created us and God knows best what we need. And so if we do it God's way, we can't be wrong. If we do it man's way, most likely we're going to be wrong. That's just the simple reality of the situation. So if we do things as God has commanded, we can't possibly be wrong. Seven days you shall consecrate them. 
And you shall offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement. And you shall cleanse the altar when you have made atonement for it. And you shall anoint it and sanctify it. Seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Okay, so all the way through these last few verses, we realize that this, this process that they did with the bullock and the two rams, all of this was to be done seven days. And any new priest, any descendant of Aaron that was to, to become a priest, had to go through this process for seven days. Why seven days? Because seven days of creation. What happens when we become priests in the New Testament? We are recreated. We are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. So, again, the seven days has a meaning because it is a recreation, essentially, is what this is typifying, is what this is pointing to. Is that you are going through a process where the old you is dying and the new you is being born. And that's what to be born again means. Somebody says, I'm a born again Christian. Well, great, you're redundant for one thing. And what does that mean? To be reborn is to go down into that watery grave of baptism where you will die spiritually. The old man is, is destroyed the same way that all of the wickedness in the world was destroyed by the flood. And you come up out of the water a new creation. And so creation took seven days, so seven days. That's, that's what the, the symbolic meaning here is of the seven. And so they had to do this for seven days to become a priest. They had to, they had to sacrifice a bullock. Um, and do that atonement for the altar. And after it was done, after they completely finished with the ceremony, they had to clean the altar. And they had to do that for seven days. And then we come to verse 38 and the rest of the chapter and pay attention to this. This is what you shall offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. So now that they've become priests, here is their daily duty. This is something they had to do every day. They had to offer two lambs every day, one in the morning and one in the evening, continually. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb shall offer at evening. Verse 40, and with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. So there's the wine as an offering. Um, this is for food. This is a meal. And the other lamb shall offer it even and shall do thereunto according to the meat offering of the morning. In other words, do the same thing. And according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Jehovah, where I will meet you to speak there unto you. Okay, so any new commandments, any new things that, that, that the people needed guidance on from Jehovah, the priest was supposed to go and they would offer these daily sacrifices the morning and the evening daily sacrifices well what happened to those why why was so much sacrifice need to be made well because the priests couldn't work the priests were to be ministering before jehovah and they were supposed to be sanctifying for the people uh, a daily reminder of the sin of the people and that they, they needed uh, God and they needed his Messiah who he would send and so all of these reminders it was a daily reminder to them of that they had to sacrifice a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening and so since the priests could not work they couldn't hold down a job and they couldn't feed themselves this is where they got their food from is, is they would get their food from these sacrifices verse 42 this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Jehovah, where I will meet you to speak there unto you, and I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So God's presence was going to sanctify the, the tabernacle. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to be ministers to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am Jehovah their God, they, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am Jehovah their God. So, <coughs> God comes to dwell in the, the tabernacle, not, not the whole presence of God. We're not talking that, hey Trent, welcome aboard. Um, we're not talking that, that God in, in some kind of a, a whole physical sense, because God is, is essentially bigger than the universe. 
but his presence was there in reality in the tabernacle and he sanctified and i believe that that when we talk about god's presence that this is the theophany that we are still talking about jesus that that this is him pre pre-incarnate this is him before he becomes man that that god has always worked through his son to communicate to mankind and so when we talk about the presence of god being in the tabernacle we are talking about this god the son and um, his presence being in the tabernacle sanctified it and all those who interacted with it and then later the temple god comes and he dwells in the temple uh, in a sense and he sanctifies it well in the new testament who is the church it's it's that new testament temple and so god dwells in us not in a uh, again in a literal sense he dwells in us i believe through the word which is what sanctifies us ephesians 5 26 um but because the thoughts the mind of god from what we read in the new testament are provided for us um then god has come to dwell in us in that manner and in dwelling in us he sanctifies us as his temple um there were a couple of i think i put too high um see, why are you doing that let's see here so i want to kind of end with this and, and i've said this multiple times through multiple lessons here um but just again the idea of the sacrifices needed to take away and how they typify christ and they point to things in the new testament hebrews 10 verses 1 and 2 says for the law this is the law of moses having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of these things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect there's nothing in the law of moses that can make somebody perfect or, or sinless or complete before God. They were shadows, they were pointers to the spiritual reality of the New Testament. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. And so if we if we read what the Hebrew writer is saying, if we try to go back to that Old Testament and we try to live under that, then we're trying to live under a shadow. We're trying to live under lesser things, a flawed law that was incapable of washing away sins. It, it says it right here, that those sacrifices could never, never make anybody perfect, even if they were offered year by year continually. Daily sacrifices, evening and morning, the sin offering, the, 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 the offering of atonement on Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement, could not take away the sins of the Israelites. We, we speak of it in terms of, well, they rolled it forward for another year. Or we could talk about the blood of Christ going backwards uh, at the cross and washing away their sins. However you want to look at it, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, but these things are only pointers. And they give us a, a deeper understanding of the things that we do under the New Testament. The things that are uh, required now for all men whether you are descended from uh, Jacob or you are descended from uh, Noah or whoever, all men of every kind are required to obey the gospel, to follow the law of Christ, not the law of Moses, and not go back into the shadows. So anyway, um, that's the end of the chapter. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I... Uh, like I said, I got a busy day, so uh, a good 45-minute uh, rundown for a fairly long chapter. I'm very, very happy uh, with that. So uh, I will uh, hopefully be on tomorrow, and we will continue on with some of the other things that Moses was commanded in the Mount, and uh, hopefully some better understanding of pointers to things in the New Testament as well. Uh, if you got something out of this, please share it. I'll have it up on YouTube eventually one day. Um, and again, thank you for tuning in. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon.